Hey everyone and welcome to another video. Today I will finally be sharing my full unedited interview with Stephen D'Souza for the CBC's flagship news program, The National. Now I say unedited, but the only thing I cut out was from the beginning, uh, the beginning portion of the conversation where when we were kind of getting to know each other and talking about our old stomping ground, um, because it, it turns out actually we grew up in towns not too far from each other. Um, so as that contains personal information, I felt it was appropriate and necessary to leave that bit out. Now, for those of you familiar with my channel, you will see that despite my low opinion of mainstream media outlets like the CBC and their journalists, I engaged with Stephen in good faith and respectfully. As I mentioned in my previous video, I try to stay on topic as much as possible and put less focus on debunking specific claims as I normally do across my other content, all while making sure I answered in a way that would be difficult to take me out of context. Um, and But as most of you know by now, they still manage to do it. But the difficulty to do so seems to have meant they could only include 3.5 seconds of what I said out of an over 20-minute interview. I think that says a lot. Now, overall, considering the constraints that came with trying to keep to his topic of influencers and influence campaigns surrounding the Beijing Olympics, with a side addition of illustrating how imbalanced the conversation on China is, I was pretty happy with how it went. I mean, looking back at the interview, I would say the only point I would have liked to clarify more was related to when we were jumping back and forth between the topic of Xinjiang and Hong Kong. When I illustrated... Um, the portion where I was trying to illustrate how much access journalists and even U.S. politicians had to Hong Kong as they literally cheered on the rioters from the ground, I wanted to make the point that even when we're faced with a China-related situation that's impossible to dispute the level of access and ability journalists had to get the full story, they still don't report the full story or even deliver anything that resembles honest and complete reporting, not even in the slightest. So why is it people expect anything different in Xinjiang and sell more restrictive access as the reason they can't get the full story, especially when you consider they're already not reporting on critical information already available on this topic, inconvenient to their narratives. I think uh, what I'll do here is I'll probably stop here. I'll allow you to see the full interview. And I, what I'll do is for the rest of what I want to say, I'll return after the interview is finished and explain to people who say that I should go easy on folks like Stephen D'Souza or the other people behind the scenes who worked on this piece, including producer uh, Michelle Song and uh, associate producer Shamir Chabra. I think Sh Samir Chabra, yeah, if I pronounced that correctly. Um, because they're simply doing their jobs or have little control over the... Um, uh, the expectations that a propaganda outlet like CBC puts on them. You know, I'll, I'll talk about why I think these foot soldiers who sell themselves out to this kind of dishonesty need to be held accountable and remembered for what they did um, and what they continue to do and, and shouldn't be able to just get away with this kind of deceit like they always have. Now, with that said, I will leave you with the final interview and I will see you guys on the other side. On the social media side, do you consider yourself an influencer? Um, I, I, th I think the, uh, the, the title influencer is just kind of weird to me. I mean, I, I put, I put some opinions out there, what I, I really believe in, I, 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 you know, whether people believe what I say or not, it's up to them. Um, so I don't know. I just have a weird relationship with the word influencer. I, I create content. I put my perspective out there and let people do what they want with it. So, yeah, I was going to say, how, uh, maybe that answers my next question, which is how would you describe the videos that you do? I would say they were, uh, filling in missing pieces, pieces that are missing from the mainstream media. Um, I feel like there hasn't been, uh, you know, the, the Hong Kong protests is really what got me into doing the content that I'm doing. I had a lot of, uh, I mean, I lived in Hong Kong for a while. I had a lot of friends who lived in Hong Kong who wanted to speak out against the rioters, but their side of the story wasn't being told. Um, I mean, Hong Kong was very divided that po at that point. So I put my content out without talking to any of my friends about it. But I had so many friends in Hong Kong, Hong Kong born and raised people who reached out to me and thanked me for putting that content out there because it was a dangerous time for them. If they spoke out against the rioters, their businesses could have been attacked and things like that. So that's what gave me the motivation was to just fill in the missing pieces, the pieces that are missing from the mainstream media. And do you feel those pieces are also missing with the Xinjiang story and what's happening with the Uyghurs in China? I, I, absolutely. I mean, I've been to Xinjiang. I have I have Han friends, Kazakh friends, Uyghur friends in Xinjiang. And uh, I think that a lot of the rhetoric that's going on is actually very damaging to the very people that people are supposedly trying to help. Uh, so I think it's very, very important to get the other side of the story out, which isn't getting out. 
So what do you say then to like groups like Human Rights Watch, which have, and you know, other groups that have posted, you know, quite detailed reports and have eyewitness statements. And, you know, we see satellite images of these detention centers. I mean, the BBC actually visited one uh, a few years ago as well. well. What do you say to those reports that say that there is something, you know, a, crimes against humanity essentially taking place there. Yeah, well, there's actually plenty of things that a lot of people have to say about it, including professors, uh, academics and things like that, but they don't get any airtime. Uh, so, you know, for example, with one of the most popular reports is from ASPE, uh, Australian Strategic uh, Policy Institute, and they uh, their report has been thoroughly debunked at point by point. All of the 18 allegations don't uh, stand up to even the slightest of scrutiny or the satellite images that they were using turned out to be regular schools. Or one moment they're complaining that uh, Uyghurs are uh, at an increased chance of being exploited because they can't speak Mandarin, then later complaining that they're being given uh, uh, Mandarin courses, which dilutes their culture. I mean, it's a complete, there, there are plenty of things out there that uh, uh, address those concerns specifically, but again, they, they don't really get the airtime that it deserves. And so you fully believe that there's nothing going, nothing wrong happening in that region? Oh, I'm sure there were missteps when they, I mean, they had a counterterrorism program. There, there was uh, massive terrorism issues in Xinjiang. And this didn't only affect Han Chinese people, it affected Uyghur people as well. There have been plenty of people, Uyghur people who have died. I met um, uh, the son of the Imam of Idka Mosque, who was slaughtered uh, outside the back of the, the mosque. I've, um, you know, spoken to people who have been uh, permanently disabled by terrorists. I don't, I don't think there's any way that you could possibly do a counterterrorism program without having some issues. Uh, I, I think it, it's considerably better than the other options we've seen out there, which is going in and invading and bombing countries with massive civilian casualties. Uh, but I definitely don't think... Uh, what the reality is on the ground in Xinjiang matches up with the mainstream media narrative. You know, the, the sort of the crux of our story is that, uh, you know, China is using social media to sort of bolster its image ahead of the Olympic Games. And, you know, there's a report in the US showing that China is paying a company to, you know, hire influencers to do this, which I mean, you know, is within the rights of countries to promote their image. Uh, but, you know, there is criticism saying that, you know, this is being done to, I guess, I don't know what the right word is, maybe paper over, but like smooth out some of the criticisms and provide propaganda in a sense. And what, what do you say to that? I mean, because some might say that even you, you yourself are, are, are participating in that. Well, I'm not participating in any sort of a campaign. I don't uh, benefit financially from anything I do. As a matter of fact, I go through great expense, uh, both uh, time-wise and uh, financially to do what I do. Um, I think that uh, Beijing promoting their city seems like a fairly ordinary thing that cities do all over the world. In terms of, uh, in the context of having human rights abuses, I, I just, I don't think, I wouldn't at least expect somebody who's being paid by the Tourism Board of San Diego to ask them, say, why would you be doing this when the U.S. just drone striked a family of 10 people, including seven children that were running to their father? And the guy who warned us that most of these drone strike programs kill civilians is in jail, Daniel Hale, or talking about Julian Assange. I mean, Canada has its own influence program that was revealed a, a, a few days ago, which is the Halifax shipbuilding uh, project, which is uh, billions of dollars over budget, um, which is supposed to build uh, Coast Guard ships and things like that. So Ottawa is paying influencers and, and giving them specific talking points as well. It's the same thing. I wouldn't ask those people that are participating in that saying, well, how do you feel about doing this when you know the, the, the graves of Native children are still being uncovered? The truth and reconciliation recommendations still haven't been fully implemented and people are living on reserves without clean drinking water. I think, I mean, maybe people should do that, but the fact that this is happening in an unbalanced way and saying, well, why can Beijing promote their city when we think there's human rights abuses going on? I think we need to step back and say, OK, well, is this really the standard? Should we all be doing this going forward? I mean, the premise of that answer, though, is that there is bad stuff happening in Canada. Therefore, you know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't you know, you can't really question what's happening in, with influence campaigns. I mean, does that assume then that there are bad things happening in China as well? Well, I think so. So first of all, I think it's important to know I have serious issues with the allegations and the, and the, and the veracity of the allegations being made against China, specifically in the Xinjiang region. But I, I, I can just take a step back from that and say, even if you think there are things going on, I mean, th th we're not 
uh, giving the same equivalence to other countries like the US when they have, you know, whatever it is, police brutality or high incarceration rates or kids in, in cages on the border. I, I mean, we don't we don't have the conversation in the same way. And actually, even the uh, when we start approaching this topic of Beijing running these influence campaigns, their influence campaigns, if anywhere else in the world was doing the same thing, it would be called a marketing campaign. So I think we definitely we need to just take a step back and say, okay, well, what are we doing here? Does it make sense? And are we going to apply the same standards to ourselves as well? You know, I, I take your point that you say you don't get paid directly for the videos you do, but at the same time, you do seem to enjoy a freedom to post on sort of, you know, YouTube and others that I don't think an average Chinese citizen does. How, how does that work exactly? Well, I mean, people in China, they're, they're, there's a lot of people in China who are using VPNs. I think, you know, uh, the, the people who are, there's, you know, millions of people who are using foreign internet sites that are blocked in China, from China. And it's not because they have any sort of special privileges or anything like that. People know how to, to get onto these sites. So, I mean, I don't think that's anything special. But in your case specifically? In, in my case specifically, I, I do it the same way that everybody else does it in China. Which is using a, a yeah, well, so yeah, yes. So a, a VPN is one thing, or if you use uh, what I use most of the time is I have a foreign SIM card, and and anybody who has a foreign SIM card in China can use the uh, open internet and access any website. I've heard or read that you know your videos have actually been played at, at government news conferences. I guess is that is that a sign that you know the the party agrees with what you're saying, or is that just kind of a nice ego boost uh, when 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 you when you put out the you know the, the material that you do well i'm glad that the the material reached more people i wasn't notified before they used it it was kind of a surprise to me as well um i don't think i think if if my beliefs are that the mainstream media narrative against china is flawed and isn't honest and i put that content out there i'm not surprised that there are people in china who pick that up and say oh look at this you know and you can take that for whatever it is, but I don't think it should take away from the actual content of what I'm saying. And that's the problem. And that's actually one of the reasons why I haven't looked for any way to monetize this as well, because I know if I did that, it would be it would become about, well, why is he doing what he's doing? What is he gaining from this financially? I, I think this is a really important message to put out there. And even without doing that, even without that care, whenever mainstream media outlets engage with me, it's always about not engaging with the things I say, but saying, why are you doing this? Why is your narrative not matching up with mainstream media narratives? I mean, as is evident by, by uh, in, in some ways by this piece as well. How does a Canadian end up in China doing this, doing the kind of stuff you do? So I came over and I did business. Uh, I did some import export. I opened up a brewery here and things like that. This is not what I came here to do. Uh, it was really the events in Hong Kong that pushed me to say, okay, there's a huge side of the story here that's not getting out. And to really illustrate my earlier point about mainstream media not covering the other side of the story, uh, the New York Times piece, who's influencing the influencers, which is one of the articles your team sent to me, I was supposed to be in that. And when they asked me questions about what I was saying about the national security law in Hong Kong, I tied in specific examples of things that happened in Hong Kong that the New York Times never covered, verifiable 100% true things from uh, uh, you know, a regular man standing up to the rioters being lit on fire to another man being killed with a brick to women being beat up in the streets. And I said to myself, after I did that reply, I said, you know what, this is, these are facts that the New York Times has never ever covered. I think that they're either going to take what I said out of context or completely drop me from their story. And they did. They dropped me from the story. And so those facts had a chance to reach their audience. And they said, no, nope, and they cut it out for whatever reason. Within that report also, they cited claims of uh, forced labor allegations against China. And they included allegations against Nike and some other companies. But one was missing, Skechers. They used to write about the allegations towards Skechers. But Skechers went in and did an independent investigation into these factories, unannounced visits, and they found nothing to corroborate the Aspie reports talking about forced labor. Instead of acknowledging that Skechers did this, New York Times just completely dropped them from their coverage, pretended they didn't exist anymore, and continued with the allegations against people who haven't done those investigations yet. I mean, I think that's an important piece of the story that at least the public should know about. Is it difficult, though, for Western media to get the full story when China, for example, is expelling a lot of foreign journalists and is, is limiting the access that foreign journalists do have? I mean, I don't think so. These facts are all available to everybody. I mean, it, it, it's, it takes a lot of effort 
um, and very deliberate uh, intent to ignore something, to not cover a story like an ordinary Hong Konger being lit on fire by the rioters. I mean, that seems like a pretty important thing to put a lot of focus on and to really tell the other side of the story. I mean, not only were journalists allowed in Hong Kong, uh, American sitting senators were allowed to fly over to Hong Kong and cheer on these same rioters. And I can only imagine what would have happened if in reverse, Chinese yeah. Communist Party officials flew over to the Capitol Hill riots to cheer on the uh, rioters there. I think that that would be ne next to a declaration of war. So I think uh, I, the facts are pretty easily available. Yeah, I mean, Hong Kong is one example, but what about in China? It's in mainland China itself, in Beijing and, you know, there are, you know, a handful of Western journalists who are based in the region now, but in a large number have been expelled and, you know, getting access to the re to the country is incredibly difficult these days. Yeah, I mean, B BBC, as you mentioned earlier, got, went into one of the uh, vocational training centers. I mean, they're journalists all the time, all around China, picking up all sorts of stories. And in most cases, what I see is trying to that make story, something. I, I should say that story is two years old, though, uh, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are still foreign journalists operating in China. So, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm I not belonging to any sort of a, a state apparatus here, and I can travel around freely and, and see everything for myself as well. When I went to Xinjiang, it was completely by myself. I booked it by myself. I booked the hotels by myself. I mean, any anybody can, can do this. So uh, I, I don't think that there's really a, a difficulty to find the missing pieces of information that I've been putting out there. So what's your message then to, you know, Canadians who are going to be watching the Olympics and, you know, likely see coverage on CBC and other networks uh, talking about, you know, the reports of, of human rights abuses in Xinjiang? What, what, what's your message to them? Uh, you know, the, what are the missing pieces that they should know about? Well, I think before they really engage with a lot of the missing pieces or read the report, for example, that debunked the Aspie uh, Uyghurs for Sale report on forced labor, they need to recognize that the uh, narrative really is unbalanced right now. There isn't an honest conversation going on about this stuff. So, I mean, here we are looking for uh, foreign influencers in China and trying to figure out what's driving them. Yet ASPE is an organization that's funded by the U.S. State Department and arms manufacturers like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon, who said in their uh, Q4 earnings call that the tensions around the Asia region is going to be a profit potential for them in the future. And uh, media outlets are boosting them without holding them accountable for their funding. I mean, the CBC has also used ASPE without disclosing to their audience that they're funded by the U.S. State Department and arms manufacturers. So I think a very, very essential first step before somebody becomes open minded enough to hear the other side of the story, something that contradicts the mainstream narrative that's been indoctrinated into their minds is to first recognize and look for the, what I'm saying, that there has never been an honest conversation on this topic to begin with. I mean, this is, yeah, I guess this is a very sort of imperialist sort of criticism, right, of what's happening, what the U.S. has done in the past when it criticizes China, I guess, right? Is that sort of... I mean, I don't think it has to be imperialist or anything. I just think it's a bad idea for arms manufacturers who profit from conflict, funding think tanks that ramp up aggressions towards China and uh, uh, ramp up the idea that China needs to be confronted. And then their reports that they produce with military industrial complex funding then gets fed into mainstream media outlets uncritically without mentioning that conflict of interest. I mean, I just think that's a basic journalistic kind of integrity thing that needs to be done. Uh, Daniel, sorry, I just want to make sure I got the, the, some of the numbers right in terms of when you moved to China, how long you've been there? Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I moved here in 2008. 2008. Okay. Yeah. And, so, and I had about a two year period where I was living in Hong Kong in between. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was just thinking, I was, I was just doing the math in my head. It's 2008 in my mind still seems like yesterday, but it it's, does. <laughs> Time goes so really fast. Yeah. Long, although, although that seems like a lifetime ago now in, in, in the context of the pandemic. Indeed. Indeed. Um, I just wanted to just double check if there's anything else I wanted to ask you. I think I covered mostly what I wanted to ask. And you and like you said, you you haven't received money for any of the videos you do, and you don't never. I, I, there no was one, yeah. Event. There was one instance where after I finished an interview, I was offered a very small amount of money for the uh, for my time, but I refused it uh, because again, I wanted to be really, really careful that people didn't focus on that. I, I think content creators who make money from what they do, there's no problem with them, but. I'm, I really feel strongly about the message that I want for people to, uh, to, to, to hear the other side of the story, that I don't want any sort of a instance like that where people are just going to focus on that. I'd like people to pay attention to what I have to say and engage with what, I, what, I, uh, what I'm actually saying, the content of what I'm saying. Um, you know, I hope eventually the, the, the um, CBC does that. I'm in contact with your producers of the Marketplace 
uh, based on their report uh, from the uh, uh, forced labor uh, uh, Xinjiang tomatoes kind of a, a story. And uh, I mean, I had a lot of I had a lot of issues with that too. There was no balance. There was nobody uh, talking about the other side. There mm -hmm. was. Um, they included a testimony from Tersene Ziawadin, whose story changed four times, whose passport was renewed in China and she left China legally. And her passport was apparently renewed while she was under house arrest. And the producers knew that her story has changed multiple times, yet they didn't think that it was a really important detail and they didn't inform their audience about it. Um, they're, they're just, yeah, they're, 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 I hope there's eventually an honest conversation about this. There's plenty of other academics, actual professors out there who are disputing these things too, but they just don't get airtime. Nobody's reaching out to them. I guess YouTube is the platform then that they have to. I mean, to. yeah, a lot of a lot of people are doing that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I can't speak to the uh, intentions and what's driving the other people, but I just think this is really, really important to get out there. Like we've seen what uh, sanctions against countries does. It affects the people on the, the on, at the bottom of the food chain. And these uh, forced labor allegations have resulted in factories sending Uyghur workers home and refusing to hire any Uyghur workers. That's institutionalized racism. That's a problem. And even in the CBC marketplace piece, when they were interviewing the factory, the factory told them, they said, we don't hire Uyghurs anymore. That should have been a red flag. That should have been a moment when the, when the, when the reporter said, whoa, hold on a second, that doesn't sound right. I mean, unless there's an assumption that the only possible way that a Uyghur is ever working is if they were forced to work. Otherwise, you have to concede that, oh, this rhetoric might be actually taking real job opportunities away from Uyghurs. And uh, you know, job opportunities was an essential piece of the fighting extremism as the World Bank and a number of reports have shown poverty is one of the leading drivers of extremism that leads people towards extremism. So, I mean, if people are really out here to, to help the Uyghurs, they should be thinking about what damage is my rhetoric doing? And what damage is it doing if I'm not engaging in this topic very uh, honestly? I mean, it's, it's an absolute tragedy and it's happened over and over again all around the world with the US sanctions. Uh, on Cuba, on different places. Richard Nephew, who's part of the US government, said that the purpose of sanctions on Iran was to drive up unemployment. I mean, th these are these are not meant to help people. And there's an underlying uh, geopolitical agenda behind pushing these stories. And that's why the US State Department funds these stories as well. The US State Department isn't funding stories about US human rights abuses. And on the contrary, if you're Julian Assange, you'll be locked up. If you're the ICC and you say that you want to investigate war crimes in Afghanistan uh, caused by the US, you'll be sanctioned, as we saw. They were completely sanctioned for even thinking about investigating US war crimes. So I think there's just there's no balance in what's going on. And that, that's what that's what drives me. I'm just I'm, I'm frustrated by it. I think it's 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 unbelievable. Uh, it, that covers what I wanted to ask. Any final thoughts just on this on this topic of China using influencers to bolster its image before the Olympics? I mean, uh, yeah, again, I think I think it's a, a fairly ordinary thing for a city to do. I mean, uh, Beijing's going to be in the spotlight and they want to advertise the city. Uh, the uh, uh, the history of the city, the culture of the city, what kinds of things there are to do in the city. I think that's a pretty ordinary thing that any city would do uh, that's hosting you know, the Olympics. I guess it's, it is beyond the city though, right? Like it, there are videos, like there were tours up to Xinjiang. There are, you know, it's more, it's about China itself, not just Beijing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I hope if if uh, if Canada uh, uh, does a um, a campaign to advertise a sporting event that they could also advertise the entire country and make it a, a you know, show show all of the kind of positives of Canada and encourage tourism to Canada. I would hope that they do the same thing. Excellent. Daniel, really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks very time. much. This is, I guess it's what, it's like 1130 in the morning for you? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. Yeah, coming on to 12, coming on to 12. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. 12 o'clock already. Uh, yeah. I really appreciate this. Um, I will send you some links when it goes up. I think the plan is for this to go on Monday. Uh, so I will uh, be in touch or my team will be in touch with you uh, once once it goes out goes to air. Yeah, sure. And uh, I, I want to send you just more on a personal note, I want to send you a video that Al Jazeera did. Now, Al Jazeera is part in my mind, part of this unfair kind of coverage of China, but they did a really reflective video about the coverage of China and mm -hmm. analyzing how journalists and outlets cover China in this really kind of uh, illogical way. And, and so if ever there's a point where you guys want to talk about uh, the allegations more specifically or digging into um, how uh, illogical uh, the narrative is, I'd be happy to come back and talk about that because it's, it's something that nobody's really had a chance to, to air out uh, so far. If you could send me uh, in the meantime, the, um, 
the uh, the breakdown you said uh, there's a, sure. the, uh, the report that, yeah yeah sure the one that you said sort of debunked point by point if right. you could send me that I'd be I'd be, I'd be interested to read that because I don't think I excuse me come across that one so for sure I'll send that over and take a look and see what you think okay awesome yeah. all right thanks sounds so much. good all right thanks thanks chat see ya okay guys I hope you enjoyed that interview but more importantly find it useful to see what outlets like these do after you compare what you just saw to the final report that they produced. I'll leave a link in the description to their final report and also my initial response video, which digs a little bit more into the problems of this particular report. Um, a report that contained 3.5 seconds, a 3.5 second soundbite of an out of context comment that I made to make it appear as if I wasn't disputing their claims against me, even appearing as if I was admitting to being a part of it. How they also allowed Aspie to freely make claims against the group of people I was placed into and refused to provide me with the equal opportunity to have CBC's audience hear my criticisms and response towards Aspie in return. When you realize that I told the CBC how I expected the New York Times to either cut me or cut me out of context completely for their piece only to have the CBC to go on and do that, that very same thing. You know, when you realize that I explained how dishonest it is to include, um, uncritically include, think tanks like Aspie, who are funded by the you know, military industrial complex and the U.S. State Department, without disclosing this to their audience, then only to have the CBC to go on and include that exact think tank in their final report without disclosing these details to their audience. And when you realize that I demonstrated to Stephen how imbalanced the narrative on China is and how that's what drives me, only to have him also produce an imbalanced final report, never mentioning my motives to his audience and pigeonholing me into this group he suspects is driven by clicks, really helps to emphasize my point about how shameless these people are and how intentional their dishonesty is. Dishonest reporting that tells only half the story distorts even the portion they do decide to report on, and that lacks any honest due diligence, is the kind of reporting that has continually been used to massage public opinion, manufacture consent for aggressions, and has literally paved the way for mass human suffering over and over again. Journalists like Stephen D'Souza, producers like Samir Chabra and Michelle Song, and all of the other mainstream media journalists engaging in this kind of dishonesty shouldn't be able to just walk away from this laughing without ever being called out for their individual behavior and participation. And this lit laughing is literally what they do. I will leave you with a clip to help emphasize that point. You can listen to journalists at the 2004 White House, 2004 White House Correspondents Dinner, literally laughing about the lies they helped promote, which excused and paved the way for mass atrocities. Now, the video will cover a few time periods related to the, the topic in general of perpetual lying and lack of basic humanity and compassion. That illustration will also double as an example of what real, actual evidence of genocidal behavior looks like, beyond just trying to draw lines between arbitrary dots like so many of the reports on Xinjiang do. Now, if you'd like to get a better understanding of what real evidence look, looks like, you want further evidence beyond the clip that I, I'll show you, you can look up the images of things like Abu Ghraib, for example. I'll let you do that on your own because when I shared those details on Twitter, they suspended my account when I, when I shared those details and, and said that this is what real evidence looks like. And Twitter claimed that I was glorifying and celebrating acts of violence or encouraging it, whatever, whatever that means. Um, and if you want even more, I would say pretty graphic uh, evidence of what genocidal behavior looks like, and you're strong enough to look at some very disturbing realities, you can take a look at the Twitter account um, FDefects, F-D-E-F-E-C-T-S. Um, it belongs to folks at a hospital in Fallujah where since the uh, U.S. used depleted uranium weapons and white phosphorus on lo the local population, 144 out of 1,000 babies are born with severe debilitating birth defects it's 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 terrible um if you're if you're disturbed really easily or you, you don't want to look at graphic images don't don't look at the account uh, you know they, they post images almost every day um quite frequently of the new cases that they receive uh, but they too have begun 
uh, to be censored by Twitter. From here, I'll start with the clip that I mentioned of the uh, specifically of the correspondence dinner, and then I'll move into the uh, second video clip that I mentioned uh, above. Media outlets and their propaganda foot soldiers, they need to be held accountable, and they need to be remembered for this behavior. You know, don't don't be fooled when what when and if they superficially cover past lies and atrocities, and not even in its full extent, and take this as some sort of a sign of repenting when it's too late, after the damage is done, especially when they're showing no signs of improving their reporting practices as a result of that, and they're continuing to do that very same dishonest reporting, free from any due diligence, laughing about it all together when you get them in the right environment where they let their guards down. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video. <laughs> Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. <laughs> Nope, no weapons over there. <laughs> Maybe under here. Half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. We think the price is worth it. The Iraqi denials of supporting terrorism take their place alongside the other Iraqi denials of weapons of mass destruction. It is all a web of lies. Those weapons of mass destruction got to be somewhere. Harbors ambitions for regional domination, hides weapons of mass destruction, and provides haven and active support for terrorists. Nope, no weapons over there. <laughs>